Financial Source webinar will be led by our presenter, Chris Reed, the CEO of CR Strategies, LLC. Chris has 40 years of experience in real estate sales, management, operations, and professional development training. She is the managing broker owner for CR Realtor. Chris is a licensed instructor and has authored countless courses and education resources. She is certified CRB, CRS, GRI, ABRM, SRS, SFR, SRES, CIPS, BPOR, and CRETS. Her company is designed to assist real estate licensees, teams, managing brokers, owners, and associations by strategically pursuing growth and profitability for, quote, success on purpose. If you have questions at the end, you are more than welcome to reach out Chris directly at chris at chrisareed.com. So let's get started. I'm excited to turn things over to Chris and welcome her as the very first presenter of the Financial Source webinar series. Chris, over to you. All righty. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and or good morning if you're in a different time zone. I want to thank Casey for um, that introduction, but I also want to thank NAR, your National Association of Realtors, Members, Dues in Action, for addressing an issue that many members can take advantage of. Um, there's a statistic, a study, it was just two years ago that NAR recognized the need to address assisting agents with their financial planning. 43% of realtor members are not preparing for retirement. Another study, 42% have not prepared for any financial crisis. So kudos to, your, to NAR for um, addressing addressing that issue. Let me just see, I want to go to the next slide and it's, there's my little button. Okay, all right. So what I am concentrating on today, yes, we are talking about planning for financial well-being um, and, and I'm, we're going to, I'm gonna be intermixing talking about individuals, brokerages, and teams. In some cases, you might be all part of all three of those categories. Uh, if you're a brokerage, You've got individuals, you've got brokerages. If you're a team, you're sponsored by a broker and you're an individual. So I'm interspersing throughout as we go on here. What I'm concentrating on today um, is the retire, retire, the exit strategies and the succession planning. I have a new hero that I've been, that I've been quoting for the last the, the last year. Simon Sinek, if you're not familiar with Simon Sinek's book, it's all about the why and you start with the why. And by the way, that that link at the bottom will take you, if you just Google it, it will take it to an 18 minute video where Simon talks about why it's so important to know the why and then you look at the how and then you look at the what. And following along with this premise, I'm going to use that. Let's start with why? Why should you be planning? You're in. You're starting your business. You're in the middle of your business. Why should you be thinking about retirement and an exit strategy and a succession strategy? Well, first of all, financial stability. You are working hard to grow your business, or you have worked hard to grow your business, and your business has value. So when you have uh, planning for residual income, for retirement. If you do the planning correctly, you're going to have stability financially, maybe whether it be residual income for not only yourself, but your family, your heirs, um, as well as any ongoing business that you're leaving as you're exiting. Protecting your assets. Um, now, assets is not just your brick and mortar but it's your computers, it's your, it's your equipment, it's your database, it's your people within the brokerage. So financially planning and protecting those assets so that they have a continued life after you're exiting or whether it be by choice or by a life-changing event. 
Avoiding, if you have a business, if you have a team and you're going to have ongoing business, why should you plan? Because you don't want to avoid to have any disruption in that service. You want to have your clients to continue to have the level of service that they have come to expect from you. Proactive versus reactive. Um, you notice by my, my tagline for success on purpose, I know a lot of individuals, a lot of teams, a lot of companies who have succeeded despite themselves, <laughs> succeeded on accident versus if they had strategically planned for things ahead of time, imagine where their growth could go. Well, this concept, this is the same thing for financial planning. You want to be proactive. Do it when you have time to be really thinking about it versus reacting in a time of a crisis. So that's the why. Now, the how, okay, yes, careful planning, uh, addressing certain resources, reviewing the resources that you have to look at, strategic process, strategic planning, and again, proactively, uh, proactive versus reactive for that success and purpose. Um, why am I stuck? Ladies, I am stuck. Okay. This is the, um, this is actually the website for the Center for Financial Wellness. Um, and when you go to that website, there's, I mean, when we're talking about resources, what resources? And, and NAR, I would start with the resources that NAR provides for you. What they're building when they started this whole center they're starting to build a lot more resources that people can, that members can use when they're thinking about doing their, their planning processes. In, when you go into this site, you have wellness essentials, budgeting and finance, real estate investing, retirement planning, succession planning, and then there's even a tools and calculator section that you can plug in, okay, if I put in $5,500, into my IRA at age 35, what's it going to be worth when I, if I retired, if I decide to retire at 65? Some, finan some fantastic tools in that toolbox that they already have in there. We're concentrating on this particular section is retirement planning. Now, in the, in all these different boxes, you're going to see things like the IRA. What's the difference between an IRA, a 401k, a solo 401k? These are all methods to put in money towards your retirement. It can be overwhelming, the definitions of them themselves. An IRA, you have a, a, uh, the ability to put in $5,500. If, if you're over 50 years old, you can be doing what's called catch-up, and you can put in $6,500. Point being is whether you're 25, 35, 50, 65, it's never too early or too late to start thinking about your retirement. And proactively planning for that is a huge step to your financial stability as you go forward. So we talked about as far as um, financial advisors and as the disclaimer said I am not I am not an accountant I am not giving accounting type of when we go into some examples of in income determining value you need a professional financial advisors Casey mentioned the next webinar and I, I do want to call your attention to that because uh, the 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 next webinar Nicole Cole is who is a wealth advisor this is on Thursday, November 14th, 2 o'clock Eastern Time, is going to be talking about tax strategies. It's going to be talking about um, how you do, how you plan for retirement income to kind of make sense out of, do I go IRA? Do I go a solo 401k? You know, trying to make sense on it. Very, very important to be using a financial planner, professional advice. They, they, these are individuals that will customize to your own individual needs for if you're an individual, if you're a team, if you're a company, helping you to structure yourself so that not only you can function better in the present, plan better for the future, and then 
going in the direction of retirement or an exit strategy. These people are current on taxes, estate planning laws, and so forth. So let's look at, since I'm concentrating more on exit strategies, um, how you get out of the business. And as an individual, when you start stop and think about what is your largest asset? Folks, your largest asset is your book of business. Whether you're, you've been in the business for three years, whether you've been in the business for 30 years, whatever, you've been dealing with a number of clients that hopefully will recognize your value, recognize your relationship, and be more apt to use you in the future. This is, you know, it, it's funny, when the recession first hit in 2008, and I dealt a lot with individuals who were struggling on, on getting business, and I was absolutely amazed at the number of realtors that did not have a systemized data management program. Now, fast forward, we're now into the past this recession. We're, in, you know, 11 years past. And think of all the CRM discussion, the, the customer relation management and all the technology. That's a big buzzword. Because in 2000, a lot of agents weren't doing that. All they had to do was be there and the people would come to you. Well, today, you really need to massage that sphere of influence, that data, that data management. When you're prioritizing, categorizing them, actively connecting, this is where your book of business is going to have value. And by the way, active connections, um, I remember several years ago when, when the, the number was like six to ten times that you should connect with your sphere during a year. I just read an article the other day, and it said that the, that, that the target number of contacts would be 33 times a year. Now, that might be bordering on pestering them, but here's, here's the point in today's world with, with social media, with, with um, all the different methods that you have to contact. Your active connections, uh, you have a lot, a lot of other choices, a lot of other options in order to, to work with those connections. What, with your database, um, what kind of information do you have in that database, in that collection of your sphere? I, I give credit always to Larry Kendall, who does ninja training. I did his course several years ago, traveled out to Denver, Colorado, and, and his whole plan is working with your sphere. He bases everything on Ford, F-O-R-D. You want to know about their family, their occupation, their recreation, and their dreams. These are the types of information. Of course, you're going to have what did they buy, what did they pay, but what, what are the kids' names, how old are they, what are their interests, do they ski, do they, do they scuba dive, whatever. You run into them in a grocery store and you look up in your phone quickly on your notes and you say, oh, gee, how's Susie, how's she doing? This is relationship building. So I'm saying as far as when you think about an exit strategy, uh, that book of business is going to have value to you if it's an active book. I want to share with you what I feel, um, what I witnessed as one of, what, I, what I'm going to say is one of the ultimate exit strategies. Individual started out, top producer, very large producer, needed some, some assistance and hired an assistant. At the time, the assistant was unlicensed. So the business was going along and the unlicensed assistant, her family uh, characteristics changed a little bit. She had some more time. She became licensed. She wanted to get more involved in the business. Well, all of a sudden, she could offer more services to the experienced agent and all of a sudden she's out showing property. So the experienced agent started saying, well, here, help me with these showings and I'm going to pay you, I'll pay you a percentage. When I close, when I sell that, that, that client, when I sell them and we go to a closing, I'm going to pay you a percentage of that. All right, so time goes on. The, the 
licensed assistant now becomes more and more competent, is actually starting to work buyers from start to finish, and the experienced agent is actually giving them, maybe giving them a whole lead, maybe forming a team, maybe not, maybe it's just kind of a loose type of arrangement, but it turns out all of a sudden they're sharing things on a 50-50 basis. Time goes on, guess what? Now, folks, I'm from Illinois. It gets cold here in Illinois in the wintertime. We have people that want to go, they, rebuy, they buy something in the warm country, all right? So this agent, they bought something down in Arizona, and this is I'm the experienced agent I'm talking about, and so they're gone for a week, another week. Next year, they go for three weeks at a time. Next year, the year after that, all of a sudden, they're going for three months at a time. And what's happening with that, that person that started out as a, an assistant is now basically doing a lot of the work. And the ultimate, it reverses where that agent is paying the, the experienced agent, the first agent, the referral fee. I call that the ultimate exit plan. And all along, that agent has known uh, their, their clients and has developed a relationship. All right, so let's go to another one. You, don't, you haven't lived through, you haven't groomed a person from the beginning, and you're thinking ahead. You're an individual, and you're thinking, you know, it's time. I'm going to start slowing down. I'm going to start doing kind of making my way out. What can I do? So fine, look around. Look, hopefully it's within your own, the same sponsored company, but is there an individual that you trust, that you feel gives the same kind of client service that you have worked with before, that you respect, they respect you, and can work together, all right? So develop a partnership. Have a, and by the way, I'm a firm believer in having a very detailed agreement. Maybe you're going to start joint marketing yourself. Maybe it's a five-year plan. Maybe you're going to start out by saying, here, if you sell somebody from my database, we're going to split it 50-50. You take it. You run. I may or may not be involved. Year two, maybe it's 40%. Year three, 30, 20, and maybe on the fifth year, 10. This is what an ultimate trailing residual income, an exit strategy. Now, in this case, the licensee that's leaving, obviously if they're re receiving a referral fee, they need to stay licensed. They need to stay in compliance with their state license law, their CE requirements, and so forth, because they're receiving a referral but it is an exit strategy. Now, if they don't want to do that, you negotiate maybe, okay, maybe it's a blanket, uh, I, you know, I'm gonna pay, I will sell my book of business for X dollars. Is it 2,000, is it 5,000? Again, I think that depends upon where they're at in their business, how active the connections they have in their database, and it, it's more of a, uh, is that second agent, what kind of value do they see in there as far as what they're willing to pay? All right, anyway, I'm not, it's not. Okay. So we go, I'm going to call your attention back to the, um, the Center for, for Realtor Financial Wellness. There is a, um, a definite section in here succession planning that talks about, you know, how do you do it? What is it? When should I start? How do I determine the business worth, et cetera? And, and again, I call you to the, your attention to using those, those um, resources. So let's first talk about emergency succession plans. And we all know nobody likes to talk about what happens if you die or what happens, but it's not always death. It might be, you could be in a car accident next week and become incapacitated for a week, a month, two months. Maybe you're in a coma. Maybe you've got amnesia for a while or whatever. And smart business 
especially if you're a company or a team, is to have a plan in place for what have for emergency succession reasons. Now, if it's a corporation, your bylaws are are probably going to have that set up. If it's a if it's a brokerage, your state laws, your state license laws will have um, outlined certain statutes for temporary actions. But what about a company policy? What about the best practices as far as how you're going to set up your business? You know, do you have a hierarchy of succession? Who's, are you going to provide a power of attorney? Folks, you owe this to the other people in your business or your team to have a plan if something were to happen to you, the leader, the owner of the brokerage or the team. So have a plan for them. Instructions about current files, computer account passwords, liabilities identified. Wow, why does somebody have to go on a, on a, um, a treasure hunt trying to find things, trying to figure out things, when if with a little bit of proactive, proactive planning, whether it be a book, whether it be um, you know, on a computer someplace or whatever, but putting some of these things down, emergency succession plans in the event of a life-changing event. Huge, proactive, huge benefit to, to your folks. Instructions for completion of transactions. I want to tell you a story about, about uh, I, I serve as an ombudsman for Illinois Realtors, and I worked, Kyle had a gal call, she's a daughter, her mother, who had not passed away, but her daughter, the daughter was moving the mother into assisted living. The mother had severe mental issues and was, putting it very politely, did not have a real grasp on reality in, in the present tense. So this daughter was cleaning up the home, putting it on the market in order to get some resources in order to support the mother in the new facilities. So she's going, now the mother had a brokerage company. She, and she had sold the brokerage company six years prior. Unfortunately, the person that bought the company had a fire and all the files, yes, it was paper files, believe it or not, were destroyed. So this daughter in and coming through comes across a bank account. It turns out it's an escrow account and it still had money in it. She had sold and closed her company. The mother had sold and closed the company a number of years ago, and here was this bank account, no records whatsoever, and she didn't know what to do with it. Here's an example of, of a situation where the hassle factor that you're leaving for someone else to figure out how to handle things. It's a real negative. You know, and keep in mind, a will is not estate planning. A will, <laughs> let me give you an example. Gloria Vanderbilt, who passed away recently, they couldn't find any will. Well, they finally found one. No one knew where they were, but they finally did find one. Her property still went into probate because it was an inefficient system. Aretha Franklin had three wills. And obviously, that created some issues. Michael Jackson, younger than those two, had very good estate planning, had a revocable, a will and a revocable living trust, much smoother. So, you know, having a revocable living trust, that is estate planning, that is going to avoid probate, that is going to help with tax planning for your heirs, and folks, it's only going to work if it's up to date. Limited liability company. Um, I'm going to, a little um, profession here. Uh, my CR strategies is set up as an LLC. And I keep operating funds in there. Any income I have goes into CR strategies. Um, and I pay my expenses out of there. And at the end of the year, maybe I pay myself a salary. All right. But so there's some money in there. And I thought one day, mm, you know what? I need to have a, a co-signer on this. I didn't have a co-signer. 
So I started to put one of my daughters on there and my financial advisor said, no, Chris, you do that. That should be in. I have a trust. I have a, 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 a revocable living trust. I had not put the LLC in there. So if I had put my daughter in as a co-signer, they were saying to me that if something were to happen to me, then that daughter, that money would go directly to the daughter and it wouldn't follow what I had set up in the revocable trust for both of my daughters and their kids. So there's an example of making sure up to date, you know, when I first put together my revocable trust, I had no grandchildren at the time. Now I do. So it, it, it all has to do with making sure that is you're keeping it current as well. So when we talk about, let's get into some happier times, <laughs> Uh, transferring leadership. Well, now I'm, I'm, I'm going to specifically talk about a, whether it be a brokerage company or a team, a team leader. And for when you're changing, when you're transferring that leadership, it's, it, here's the, the, if you look at my diagram on here, you first want to assess the change, assess what do you need for change, prepare for the change, plan for the change, implement the change, and then sustain the change, all right? So it starts with who and how are you going to choose someone to be a successor for you? Passing the baton to another person. Maybe you're, you've got a brokerage company and you've been operating, you've been running everything. You're the president, the CEO, and everything. Well, maybe you're going to become the chairman of the board and let somebody else become the president and the CEO, and you're going to take a back seat. So how do you, and I, I say brokerage company, uh, I'm going to ditto this for a team. The team leader could be setting up someone to take over the everyday thing and slowly back out of the leadership role. So these concepts are going to go the same for a team as it is for brokerage. Who and how do you choose as a successor? Is it an internal person? Is it an external candidate? It's extremely important. Just like when you hire someone, you want to make sure that that person that you choose is going to have the same core values that you have, that has the same sense of client service, that has the same uh, mission, the same goals. Sure, they can maybe they can be younger, maybe they can have some new technology ideas, but the guts of it is going to make sure that you're handing this baton off to someone that's going to protect your legacy, your legacy of how this company has come about. There's a statistic, 80, in corporate America, 80% of hires are done via the resume, via the experience, via where the, these people, what kind of um, uh, successes that this individual has had. 85% of turnovers or of failures, of fires, of people that don't work out come about because of a mix, mismatch of core values, a mismatch of business ethics, beliefs. And that's why it's so important, not only when you hire someone to be part of your team or to put, put an agent into your company, but even more so in this case when you're passing the baton to make sure that that individual has the same core values that you do that has the same uh, desires for that client service. So bringing them on board and putting them in the position, uh, whether it be what's the transition? Is it going to be two weeks? Is it going to be a month? Is it going to be two years, three years? Whatever it is, there's going to be a transition. And at that time, you're exposing that person to all the facets of your team or all the facets of your organization. And I'm talking about from soup to nuts. I'm talking about all the statements, the financial statements, the liabilities, no secrets, everything's out on the open. And here's, in that transition time, you need to start delegating 
to that individual. You need to start letting that individual make their own decisions. And here's the tough one. You need to know when to let go. I'm going to step back. The team leaders, when they form a team, and this top producer is hiring a buyer's agent, and they get a lead for a for a buyer. It, the the referral is coming from someone who they've sold three homes to, and it's their kids that want to buy a home. And top producer Tom wants to be involved because they think only I can help these people. A team is going to fail if that team leader doesn't know how to let go. If the team leader is going to constantly be involved and keep their fingers in everything, what's the use? If, if there's not the confidence in the person to let them start and finish, it all comes in, what's the explanation? What's, how are we going to be transparent to the other people in the organization, whether it be a brokerage, whether it be a team, but... And, and if we're dealing with the, with the client, what, how, why are we doing, I'm going to go back to Simon Sinek, why do we have a team, how do we operate, and what's the bottom line? It's going to give you better service. Let's go to your brokerage. Folks, why are we doing this transition? Well, I'm getting close to retirement. How are we going to do it? This is the individual, and here's where we're going to be transitioning, and what's the bottom line is, folks, you're going to have a better company at the end of the time or you're going to have a better team. So, hugely important on that. Let's go to the concept of selling or determining your value of your business or determining a value of your team. Okay. Simon, why? Why do we need to determine the, the business value? Well, if you're going to buy or sell a team or a company, yeah, you want to determine the value. Um, maybe one partner is going to buy out the other partner. Maybe one of the sponsored licensees in a brokerage company is going to take over and wants to buy the company. Maybe uh, you have a transfer of Stock among family members you need to know the value of the team. Estate planning, settling estate, you need to know the value of the, when I say team or, or brokerage company. Or, and here's a sad one, maybe it's a divorce settlement and they've got, you've got to figure out what's the value that's going to go on this side of that balance sheet when they're determining um, a divorce settlement of all the assets. So there's many reasons why to develop to determine that business value, how, and again, I'm going to say that how you do it, you look at your resources, you go to professional people. Just like it's pretty darn hard for you to price your own personal property, you're too emotionally involved in it, even more so on your team or your company, your brokerage company or even your book of business if you're an individual. How are you going to put a, a dollar value on that? So bringing in a professional, some individual or individuals or companies or whatever that have done a lot of this and have a lot of experience with it is going to be huge. Where do you get these? Well, I, I mean, just to mention a few, and I'm, this is not a, an advertisement for them. I'm just using them as an example. But Real Trends, Steve Murray on his website, um, he claims that he's done over 3,200 analysis evaluations of brokerages and teams. Stefan Swanifold, um, T, T360, the same type of, type of situation. So there are companies out there. Across the, the country, there are um, even smaller scale type situations. Um, just talked to someone the other day where they were, they were estimating and they were looking at a team and looking at a team where the team leader was still involved, 30% of the volume came from them. And, you know, they looked at the EBITA, that's the earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and, um, and um, amortization. 
and he said usually you know two and a half three and a half times that at the ballpark okay most people if they're not involved in this they're not going to know that so using a professional is huge so what are they going to look at we talked about the why we talked about the how what are they looking at and on your screen asset accumulation method um, and your assets it's not just the brick and mortar if someone is coming up with a value of a brokerage company or a team the people that are going to remain is a huge asset that those people that are part of it if you've got an income method when you look at the income method and you talk about which is the next one when you talk about what they made in 2017 what's their net profit in 2018 uh, expected in 2019 projected in 2020 a lot of that is built around the people that are in there so assets are not just brick and mortar and furniture and computers but it's people as well income method yes looking at the income statement the balance statement the cash flow the net profit all those kinds of of um, statements uh, accounting processes that a good solid accountant that is going to be assisting with your business with your team to help you set up replacement value if somebody was coming in and let's say they wanted to start up a brokerage company maybe it's a franchise they want to come in and start up a brokerage in main town USA what would it cost them to develop a company as though exactly like this one that they're trying to buy you know they have to look at the recruiting numbers they have to look at the at the real estate they have to look at all those different things what so that's what a replacement value is and of course your market value um, is huge as well the um, the bottom line on this that for teams this is now a, a message directly to team people because brokerages usually are going to be coming across with much more strict you've got more people involved you've got um, you know bylaws that say you have to do this your team sometimes are, do, are doing things on a haphazard basis um, CRETS, your Certified Real Estate Team Specialist, has a course, Positioning Your Team for Profit. And it talks about the necessity of making sure that you are not only, you're making money, but are you watching the money? Making money and having profit are two different things. Is your team profitable? You're putting in a lot of time and effort into this, and is there a profit out of it? Well, you, you've got to be tracking have your income statement have your balance sheet your cash flow your um, you know your gross income per team member you know breaking it down what is the value of each one by the way I am going to um, make a reference to Bruce Tuckman in 1966 developed a theory uh, it's called evolution of team development um, and this theory while it wasn't written specifically for real estate but it can definitely be applied towards real estate where you have your team's development forming storming norming performing and the phases that groups go through in order to get to the performing stage are huge when it starts out at the forming stage the team leader or leaders if it's a horizontal structure they're doing all the decisions they are uh, setting up the company they are deciding what's going to happen they are making the job descriptions they are hiring in the storming phase conflicts start to arise some of the members of the team start challenging the leader by the way there is a statistic that 80 percent of teams never get past the storming phase why do some teams fail they don't have the leadership they don't have the proactive strategic plan process to know how to manage the people manage the profit as they're going through the ones that are successful norming performing at the performing stage 
this is where the team leader can back off. This team is now a well-oiled machine. This team can now function, you know, can the team survive without the rainmaker? If they've actually gotten to that performing stage, they've got it. And when that team leader is out of the picture, they've got a lot more value than if the if 40% of the income is still coming from the team leader. So that's all part of that value, um, that determining the business value. So again, I, I can't stress enough for individual teams to be diligent in watching the money, the income statement, the gross income, the fixed variable expenses, net income, looking at the whole picture to, to determine not only determining their value, but also a good indication as to how they want to grow and where they want to put their, uh, put their money and their efforts into. So it's kind of a summary. We started out with the why. Why do we plan for succession, for exit planning? And, and I want to go back to that question. Um, it does provide financial stability, not only for you as an individual, but for your family members, for your heirs, for the people in the company or the team that are going to continue to be working. Huge. Protecting your assets. You've put your blood, sweat, and tears into uh, building a business. And why not be able to recoup, protect some of those assets, and have continued residual income from those assets. Avoid disruption. Service client if, it, if the company or the team is going to keep on going. And I, I, again, my theme, proactively positioning and planning versus reactive firefighting to your success on purpose. On that note, um, Brittany, do we have any questions? Uh, Chris, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, that was great. Um, again, everybody, you can leave your comments and questions in the chat or via email. Um, we do have one question. Um, this is in regards to you've finally appointed a new successor. Um, but what if they continue to ask you for support? What do you do in that situation when you're supposed to step back, you know, from uh, moving forward within, you know, retirement? <laughs> well, and, and I, I, I want to go back to the importance of having sitting down, you know, it's just like when you put together a team, you plan for the divorce before you do the marriage. Well, it's the same thing on this exit strategy and the succession. You want to sit down and you try, want to try and proactively think about questions just like that. And part of what you are selling, there's many sales where there have been built in where the person is going to be staying in the company and in the, um, the position so that they can be used as a resource. Now, when you when you look at when you look at an individual, um, and here's one I know that is a, a that is a continued problem where someone has sold the company, and they're going to continue to stay involved. Maybe they're stepping back and just becoming a salesperson like everybody else. Well, they've sold the company. There's new management. There's new leadership. And there's a new person that is in charge of running that company, answering compliance questions, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the other agents, whether it be on a team, whether it be within the company, they're used to going to the individual that, that hired them, that trained them, that has supervised them for one year, two years, 10 years, whatever. And yeah, they, you need to cut the cord at some point in time and need to be working out a way to not snub your nose at the person that you've been coddling for the last 10 years, but to slowly bring in. They need to get confidence in the person that you've turned turned the baton over to. 
So that's in all, all the presentation of, of to the individuals. That's in, um, if, if someone came and asked me a question, I would encourage them to go to the person that's in charge. But if they keep on asking me and I say something, I would make sure that the person, the new person in charge knew about our conversation and tactfully try and get them into that leadership role. I hope that addressed the question. But I, I, I do go back to the, the importance of having things in black and white, of thinking ahead. If the person is going to stay on as a resource for a period of time, what are the expectations, you know, clearly defined expectations of what the new leadership, what can they be, you know, can they call them up at 12 o'clock at night? Can they call them up on Sunday morning at, at 6 with a, with a question? What are the expectations? And what, what, so iron it out and make sure that there's a good, strong working relationship uh, going forward that's healthy for everybody. Makes sense. All right, I have another question for you, Chris. You did mention um, earlier about a certified teen specialist. Can you please repeat that in terms of what that specifically is? Uh, the NAR has, this is the first and only certification, NA, a national certification program for teams. It's the CRETS Certified Real Estate Team Specialist. It is put on by REBI. Uh, your Real Estate Business Institute. There are four courses that are put together, designing and sustaining teams, uh, team leadership, HR solutions, and then positioning your, your, uh, your team for profit. In order to, each of those courses are valuable, valuable resources for people that want to start teams. Huge resources, um, a huge information. You know, some people, say, oh, let's just form a team. And, and I go back to that forming, storming, norm. You know, people just, if they were to take a little bit of proactive time for business strategizing how to do it, um, it would be huge. To earn the CRETS, um, three elective courses and then you can apply for the CRE test. It's a certification. It's not ongoing dues. One time, once you get it, it's like a GRI. Once you get a GRI, you are always a GRI. Um, so once you obtain it, and that's that's a certification on that. And by the way, so a lot of those courses, they are there are instructors across the country that you can look up and see where these courses are being held. And most of the courses are online as well. But I will tell you that a lot of the value in that is sitting in a course with sharing of ideas from other team members in how they're building their business. Okay, perfect. Um, so if you could leave us with one more point before we get ready to close, what would that be? Success and purpose. Uh, whether you're brand new in the business, whether you've been in the business, whether you're a team or a brokerage, business planning, strategically planning, not only your day, your week, but we're going, we're in the fourth quarter, folks. And now is the time, where do you want to be on December 31st of 2020? Where do you want to be five years down the line? And of course, what we've been talking about strategically planning for your exit strategy. Where are you at in your career? So it, 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 there's, you can, if you're in the water in a sailboat and you want to get to the island, if you have a rudder and you can direct yourself, you can get there faster. Whether without a rudder, you're going to go zigzag across. That's without a plan. You're zigzagging. You may get to your goal, but it's going to take you a lot longer. Strategically planning for success on purpose will be huge, whether you're an individual, team, brokerage, success on purpose, not on accident. That's my closing comment. <laughs> That's perfect. 
All right. If anybody does have any additional questions, please know that you can email Chris down at her email below, which is chris at chrisareed.com. Um, and we'll follow up via email. We would also like to get your feedback on how this presentation went. Chris, we do greatly appreciate your time and for sharing your wisdom and for just letting us know the different strategies that we have for succession and exit planning for our roles that we have here as um, realtors or brokers or um, team leads. So thank you so much for your time. We really do greatly appreciate it. And for those of you who joined in on our call, um, we will follow up via email if you want to learn more about this presentation. And Chris will also be presenting um, at Annual in San Francisco, California. So we are so excited to have her present again on this presentation. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you. And have a great day. Thank you.